Hello all and welcome to the Caregiver Support Series. Heart failure diagnoses make up close to 20% of hospice patients overall. This episode will focus on an end-of-life journey for a patient with heart failure. Everyone's end-of-life journey is certainly as unique as they are, but we can see patterns of decline in chronic diseases. Heart failure is often a slow, steady decline with a range of symptoms. So this story is kind of an illustration of a typical decline intermixed with real patient experiences of mine with identities protected, of course. So now it's time to sit back with your favorite hot beverage and learn about heart failure. I'm going to switch things up a little bit for this episode, and instead of words to describe, I will be using pictures to describe the end-of-life story of a heart failure patient named John. In the education corner, I will quickly review the flow of blood through the heart and touch on what ejection fraction, or EF, means. I will also discuss defibrillators and pacemakers in end-of-life patients. In the next episode, I will describe breathing patterns at the end of life. When I first met John, he was in his early 80s. I came into his home and introduced myself to him and then his wife, Carol. John and Carol had been married nearly 60 years, and she was his primary caregiver. It was clear from the start that Carol was very well versed in John's medical history and care, and that she was going to be a strong and informed voice for her husband. John didn't seem incredibly comfortable with the idea of hospice. With my initial physical assessment of him, I noted two things almost immediately. He was anxious, his blood pressure and heart rate were both high, and what we call labile, meaning they fluctuated greatly depending on any number of factors. And he had a very real fear of falling. At this point, John was getting around the main floor of the house independently with a walker. He lived mostly in his chair, but he was able to get to the bathroom and the bedroom. He would get mildly short of breath with those 40-foot walks. He also had diabetes and what he called a slow gut, meaning he suffered from abdominal pain and bowel issues. Over the next few weeks, I got to know John and Carol. They had a few children and grandchildren, some who lived with them and helped. John very much missed being able to golf and the fresh air involved in a good round. During my visits, I would take John's vital signs and listen to his chest and his abdomen We would talk about how the previous week went for them regarding his appetite, his pain, and any other physical symptoms he or Carol wanted to discuss. I would usually spend around an hour at their house. It wasn't all, you know, hospice talk. Carol and I swapped recipes. I watched The Price is Right or Pawn Stars with John, and we would talk about the shows and laugh together. Sometimes I would inject some education, such as explaining our emergency pack medications and how to use them, or explaining what type of medical equipment was available to them, such as oxygen, or reviewing the hospice philosophy and and our services in general. It was months before John had any sort of acute episode where he needed immediate intervention. I got a call from our triage nurses explaining the situation, and luckily I was in between visits, and my next patient was able and willing to reschedule. I called Carol and told her I was on my way. She told me that John was having chest pain and shortness of breath. I instructed her to get the vial of liquid Dilaudid from the emergency pack and give it to John, and that I would be there in 15 minutes. Since we had already had the conversation about the emergency pack, Carol felt comfortable doing this. When I arrived, John admitted that his chest pain had been about an 8 when they called, but was currently at a 5, and he felt that the Dilaudid had worked. His blood pressure and heart rate remained high during my visit. John was reluctant to go to the inpatient unit, but I think he felt 
sick and anxious enough that he agreed to go. John spent five days in our inpatient unit where his pain and anxiety was managed. During this day, the physicians really tried to normalize John's blood pressure as best they could, but it remained very labile and sensitive to medications. John was just so glad to be home and said that he had felt much better. But I could tell that that episode had taken a lot out of him. He now agreed to have oxygen in the home, and he needed a little bit more assistance to use his walker to get where he needed to go. A few more months went by, and John remained stable. During this time, he accepted a wheelchair so he could sit outside and enjoy that fresh air that he had missed. He could only walk about 20 feet without getting very short of breath. He would wear his oxygen two, maybe three times a day for four or five minutes. He also enjoyed visits from his hospice aide, who helped him get a good bath and massaged his feet three times a week. Carol noted that John was sleeping more during the day and becoming somewhat confused intermittently. She asked if I could stay with John for 20 minutes or so so that she could run to the store. John and I started chatting away, and he opened up to me in a way that I hadn't seen before, and I wondered if it was because Carol wasn't there. But he was getting some very important things out and off his chest when I suddenly noticed a very large spider coming towards me from the middle of the room. Have I mentioned I'm embarrassingly afraid of spiders? As John was talking, this thing kept getting closer and closer. I tried so hard to focus on his words. Eventually, he saw the spider and yelled. He wanted to get up and kill it himself, but he wasn't super steady, and I could tell that he was worked up. He got a hold of a fly swatter and swatted at it and then smashed it as I screeched, even though I tried very hard not to. We laughed and laughed, and he told, retold that story over and over for weeks to anyone who would listen. The next time John really needed help, it had been a few months, but he hadn't had a bowel movement in well over a week, and he was getting very uncomfortable. We had thrown a bunch of different oral options at him, and he'd either tried them before and didn't like them, or they hadn't worked yet. So he needed some more assistance from a nurse. I could tell at this point that John's appetite had been slowing down and he was losing weight. He had a very hard time getting to the bathroom and bedroom. It was after this visit that he decided he would rather use a commode so that he didn't have to use his energy to walk back and forth from the chair to the bathroom. He was not ready for a hospital bed. I was able to help John and get him comfortable at home at this time. Over the next few months, Carol noted that John was getting more and more tired and weak. He slept a lot during the day. He was also getting more and more confused, sometimes combative. We were able to manage this at home using prevention methods and sometimes medications. But a few weeks went by and John had another episode of chest pain, except this time he also had a fever and was having a very hard time staying awake. We gave him some emergency medications, but he seemed to be very, very ill, and Carol did not feel comfortable caring for him overnight. We transferred him to our inpatient unit where he stayed for two weeks. He eventually recovered from whatever infection he had, but he really wasn't the same after this episode. His pain was controlled, but he remained very weak and tired, unable to eat or drink much. He also continued to be confused. Carol got some training on how to care for him in bed and got him back home. After a few weeks, John died a peaceful death at home, surrounded by his family. Ejection fraction is a lab value that is heavily focused on in patients with heart failure. In order to understand what ejection fraction means, we have to understand the flow of blood through the heart. Blood that does not have oxygen, that comes from the veins in the body, enters the heart through the superior vena cava and into the right atrium. From the atrium, the blood is pumped into the right ventricle and then out into the lungs to receive oxygen. The oxygenated blood then re-enters the heart through the left atrium. From the left atrium, the blood is pumped into the left ventricle and then circulated throughout the body from the aorta. 
Ejection fraction is a measurement of the percentage of blood flowing out of the left ventricle during a contraction or heartbeat. A normal EF is 50 to 70%, measured most commonly through a non-invasive echocardiogram or echo. Okay, so quickly, the uh, pacemakers and implanted defibrillators, do they need turned off at some point? Pacemakers help control rate and or rhythm and do not need turned off. An internal defibrillator will deliver an automatic shock to the chest, like the paddles you see during CPR, if it detects certain abnormal rhythms. Those do need to be turned off if a patient decides they want to change their code status to a do not resuscitate comfort care. Thanks for watching. This has been an episode of the Caregiver Support Series brought to you by Hospice of Northwest Ohio. Next episode, I will discuss breathing patterns at the end of life.